Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. It's great to see all of you, all of you here with us in the room, everybody outside joining with us as well as everybody online. So glad that you're here together as we celebrate the risen Christ today. Man, that is my favorite Sunday of the year. I always look forward to this Sunday. Um, and not just because it's the time we get everybody together, but because of what it means. Easter is the centerpiece of our faith because Easter changed everything. When you think about what Christianity is all about, it's not just about Jesus who died and was buried. It's about three days later, he also raised from the grave by the power of God. And the reason that was so significant 2,000 years ago it was, was because back then, like today, when people died, they pretty much stayed dead. People didn't die and were buried, and the next thing you knew, you saw them walking around town a few days later. It changed everything. It, it caused people who were literally running and cowardice and, and denying Christ as he was being tried and crucified, the resurrection of Jesus, when they saw him and met with him and spent time with him after he was raised, it emboldened them. It gave them courage and strength and hope. And it transformed their life from this being just a movement with a great teacher that might be someone special to convince them this is the Holy One of God. Easter changes everything. But you know, admittedly, when you talk about the message of Easter, when you talk about Christ died, buried, and raised, it, the message of Easter brings a varied response from different people. It, it just does. Different people view it and think of it in different ways, and admittedly, it kind of makes sense. In fact, the Bible even said it would be the case and gives us a reason why. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The cross and the message of the cross is foolish to some. And the reason it's foolish is because some look at the cross and the message of the cross and the meaning of what is, what is communicated through its, its presence and its message. And they look at themselves and they think, you don't know all that I have done. You don't know how many mistakes I've made, all the ways I've hurt and wronged people, all the sin that's a part of me. I don't think even a good, loving God should be willing to forgive me. And they look at the cross and the message of the cross and they consider it foolish because in their minds we've done too much to deserve God's forgiveness. And then other people on the other extreme look at the cross and it's foolish to them because, well, in their mind, I don't need saving. I'm a good person. I'm not a perfect person, but I'm a pretty good person. And I can't imagine a good God ever judging good people. And so the message of the cross is actually foolishness to some when they look at it. But to us who are being saved, it says that it's the power of God. It's power and hope and life. But we look at the message of the cross and we look at that today and there, even in this room and online or wherever you're watching from, I guarantee there's a variety of responses to it. Not so different than like when my kids were young and we decided to, to introduce a new entree at dinner time around the table. Anybody ever have a, a interesting conversations about that? Was that ever drama in your house? Like we're going to eat something for dinner that we've never had before. And around our house, there was absolutely varied reactions when we would put something new on the table. First, there's my reaction, which, listen, my mom's family's Italian. My dad's family's farmers, country folk. It's got to be really bad for me not to eat it, right? Like, like stinks and smells are going to make you sick. I mean, it might not be that great. I could eat it and be like, yeah, it's all right, but I can just... Put a bunch of something on it, salt or hot sauce or something, cover it up, and I'll eat it, right? And then there's my son. You set a new dish in front of him. He just grabs a salt shaker, puts it on it, and just starts eating. And he gets halfway through, and he'd look at you and go, yeah, this isn't very good. <laughs> and then he'd just finish it, right? Because that's what teenage boys do. And then there was my daughter, who, uh, they're 23 and 21 now, but when she was little, man, you put something in front of her she'd never seen before. You set it down, she would, just her reaction would start off this way, like, what is that? And then there'd be the whole sniff test. And then before she ever tried it, the way to decide if she liked it, she'd grab her fork and dip it in the, in the meal, whatever it was, and slowly raise it up to her mouth and just touch it on her tongue and be like, oh, that's gross. I'm not eating that. I'm like, you don't know that you like that from a taste test on your fork. You got to eat it, right? But the point is we have all kinds of different responses to things. And when it comes to the gospel and the message of the cross, I mean, some of you could not wait to get here this morning. I know that because you were early for once. <laughs> like this room was pretty full before 9.30 ever, ever hit, man. This is unusual. We'll see what happens next hour because 11 o'clock, those are the people that are never on time. Like they're walking in in the middle of the sermon, right? But some of you couldn't wait to get here. Others of you, you're already like gagging and choking it down and you just came because somebody, you're kind of pleasing somebody and they wanted you to get here. And then a lot of us are somewhere in between those two worlds. 
But what's the difference? What makes the message of the cross foolish to some and power and hope and life to others? Well, I think one of the best answers we have as to why this is the case actually comes from something we've been studying for the last couple of weeks in the book of Hebrews. In the letter of Hebrews, it says this in chapter 10. It says, since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Because if it could, they would not, they'd have not ceased to be offered um, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin, like there would come a point when they just stopped. But instead, these sacrifices, Hebrews goes on to say, are simply reminders every year that we offer them. They're sacrifices, a reminder of sin year after year. When it comes to knowing and worshiping God, there are lots of different traditions and rituals even sacraments, people will refer to them as, that carry great significance and meaning to those who follow Jesus and worship God. Acts like baptism that we're going to celebrate at the end of the message today in just a few minutes. Communion that we observed together last Sunday. Special services like this on Easter and Christmas. For that matter, even our weekly Sunday gatherings have tremendously formative role in our faith. But the problem is, too often, we allow these shadows of faith to replace the reality of God. We allow these shadows and forms of, of God that are geared to point us to God, take the place of the reality and truth of who God actually is. And we all know the problem with putting that much trust in a shadow. A shadow cannot do anything for you. Kind of like the social media post I saw this week, this Real comes across my newsfeed of children noticing their shadow for the very first time. You ever seen a video like that? Like it's freaking them out and they're crying, they're scared, they're running and all of that. One little boy, literally his shadow, he's going to the left and the right and forward and back and can't get away from it. And finally he turns his body towards his mother as he's keeping his eyes on his shadow with his arms out screaming, Mommy, help! And mom's got her phone down going, Hang on, I gotta get a video for this on Facebook. Because that's why you have children, to embarrass them and get likes and people to follow and comment on your videos, right? But when it comes to God, eventually we have to understand what every child understands about their shadow. That a shadow isn't real. It can't hurt you, it can't scare you, it also can't love you, help you, play with you, or do anything for you. It's just a form of what is real. And if a child can understand that about their shadow, we at some level have to be clear about this with our religious shadows. They have an importance, they have a role. But their role is to point us to the reality of who God is. And the problem is sometimes we get disappointed. And I've talked to many people over the years that get disappointed with the, the shadow of church, for instance. And they'll say, you know what, I tried that, I've been to church. I tried reading my Bible, I tried one of those read through the Bible in a year kind of processes. I tried praying, I tried all those things, and nothing really changed. And in those verses we just read out of Hebrews, I want you to think back as to why that's the case. Why it is that a shadow can never really change you. When you put that much emphasis and effort and expect a shadow like this and an experience like this to change your life, you're going to be disappointed. Because Hebrews tells us there are some things that our shadows of God can do and some things they cannot do. First, here's some things that they cannot do. First and foremost, a shadow of God, a religious experience of God, can never make us perfect. It cannot make perfect those who would draw near. There's no amount of church services, there's no amount of Bible reading, no amount of prayer that can ever make you perfect, right, and holy before God because a shadow cannot cleanse your conscience. It cannot take the guilt and shame away that our sin has created in our lives. It cannot leave us free from the presence of all of that. And because a shadow cannot clean our conscience or make us perfect, the reason it cannot do that is because a shadow cannot take away sin. There's no religious shadow, there is no sacrament, there is no religious activity that can ever take your sin or mine that we've committed against God and take that away from us, off from us, and cleanse our conscience and make us perfect before God. It cannot happen. But here's what a shadow can do, according to Hebrews. It can remind us. And specifically, what Hebrews says is that it first and foremost reminds us of our sin. Which is why, if you're honest, some of you didn't want to be here today. <laughs> Because when you come to church, it only reminds you of all the ways that the Bible and church and other Christians and God says you don't measure up. And if anything, you leave here 
feeling worse than when you came in. And if that's your typical experience with God or with a religious shadow, I get it. I wouldn't want to feel worse every time I came either when I left. But if that is you or that ever has been you, if you've ever tried church or religion and nothing changed, I want to encourage you this morning and I want to ask you to consider that maybe the reason why that keeps happening is because you're confusing the purpose of a shadow of God with the power and presence of God in your life and what only God can do. Because if it were possible for a religious shadow to make us perfect and cleanse our conscience and take away sin, you realize you'd only have to come once. You can stand before God one day in heaven. I'm good. I went to church once, Easter 92. I'm good to go. But we know it doesn't quite work that way. And so whenever I hear of someone who, who thinks or says that church isn't for them or Jesus isn't for them and it, because it just reminds them of all the bad things and all the mistakes, I almost immediately assume that one of the reasons is probably because they've confused a shadow of God for the reality of God. Because as the Bible says, a shadow can never, by the same sacrifices offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Then why have them? Why do we have them? Why are we here? Why do we gather? Why is this day so important and so significant? If it cannot bring us near to God and make us perfect and cleanse our conscience and take away sin, why do we have them? Why does God ask us to keep so many different shadows in the Bible if they're just a form of God and not the reality of God himself? Well, because of this word right here, because while they can't take away those things, they can remind us. And the best part is that not only do these shadows of faith remind us of our sin, even more so, they remind us and are designed to remind us of God's grace and goodness and salvation. And so whether you're here today and this is your annual or semi-annual you know, religious trip to church or whether you're someone that's here almost every single Sunday and you couldn't wait to be here today, again, the exact same thing is true of all of us. That just attending this gathering is not the end goal and not the point because it cannot cleanse your conscience and make you new. Today is special. It's an incredibly special day. Not special because it's a religious holiday called Easter. It's special because it is a shadow of a worship gathering designed to cause us and help us remember the one reality that every one of us in here needs, that God came to cleanse and perfect and make new all who would trust in his son and what his work on the cross and what he accomplished when he walked out of that grave. That's what makes this so incredibly important. And so with that in mind, what I want to do in the rest of our time today is I want to discuss with you how to know and be very clear that you're not just chasing a shadow of God and you're not just trusting in a shadow of faith, but you are trusting in and standing on the reality of God and the hope of Jesus. And to do that, we're going to spend the rest of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to follow there, you can. It'll be on the screen. And here's what the Apostle Paul is writing these words that we're about to read. And he's writing these words to a group of Christians in the city of Corinth, a church that was started by his work and his interaction with them. And he, they come to know Jesus and believe and follow Jesus. And they've done some things right. And they've kind of fallen off the wagon on a few things as well. And he's writing back to them, answering some questions that they have and encouraging them in the faith. And here's what he says in chapter 15. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. Like the gospel message, what is the gospel message? And he's getting ready to explain to them what the gospel message is. But I, I, I wrote to you, I'm writing to you to remind you of what I preached to you. And when I preached this to you, you received it, you heard it, and you stand in it, and it is changing you. And then he says this, here's this message, by the way of what I preached to you. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And so important that he, that he writes these words because what he says is it's not just random, it's not just accidental, that the things that happened about Jesus were in accordance with the scriptures, things that had been written more than a thousand years, many thousands of years in some cases, before they ever took place. He fulfilled what was promised and prophesied. And then after he was raised, he appeared to Cephas, also known as Peter. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Like you could actually get, I started to say get on a plane. They couldn't get on a plane. 
But they could get on a, in a boat or they could get on a buggy or on a camel or they could just walk and they could go find these people that were there because it didn't happen generations ago. It happened a few years ago and most of the people that witnessed it with their own eyes saw the risen Christ. They're still alive. Some of them have fallen asleep and aren't with us anymore, but most of them are still around. Go talk to them. They, they'll tell you what they saw with their own eyes. And what's so crazy is that what they saw with their eyes moved them from being really cowards denying Christ when he was arrested and being crucified to boldly proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus to the point many of them were martyred themselves for the words that they were communicating because they had seen the risen Christ. And then he ends it and he says this, and then he appeared to James and the other apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me for I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And then this phrase, so incredibly important, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. Such an important Easter scripture passage. In fact, so important is 1 Corinthians 15 and what it teaches us that there have not been many Easter's. This is my 24th Easter message I believe that I've given to this church since we started in 1998. And there's not been too many Easter's that in some way I didn't reference some point of 1 Corinthians 15. And I could today spend the rest of our time going through all kinds of evidences of how Jesus proved who he was. All these external, not just in the Bible, but outside of the Bible proofs that he was he lived, he died, he was buried, he was raised, and all these things that convince us that the message of the resurrection is true. But today, what I want to do instead is I want to really camp out on this one phrase that we just read right here on the screen, that by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. When somebody becomes a Christian, it is a deeply personal experience that changes them. And it doesn't just change them a little bit. It transforms them. It moves them. They become a new person. As we read in another place in the New Testament, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in those who believe. To believe and follow and entrust in Jesus changes you. I became a Christian many, many, many years ago. As a child, I didn't want to think about how many years ago that was, actually. But as happens with every child who becomes a Christian and follows Jesus, and I was blessed to be raised in a home that believed in God and trusted Christ. And, but at some point in my late teens and early 20s, I had to move from my faith being my parents' faith to my own. Everybody goes through that, right? When you're young, your faith is your parents' faith. It has to become yours. And when I went through that process, there were some challenges and some struggles, some questions that I wrestled through and had to overcome. But as I walked through that process, when I was in college, I volunteered my time for a while with a high school youth group. Not so different than our youth group we have here at this church. And one particular weekend, there was this discipleship weekend they were having, and there was a speaker that was brought in to teach. There was a time of music and worship, like you might experience. And, and when the guy got up to preach, I remember when he announced kind of his, his passage that he was teaching on that day, I kind of checked out because the passage was one of the most familiar passages to every Christian, probably the first verse I ever memorized as a kid. It was John 3, 16 and 17 was going to be his topic that he was preaching on that day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever would believe would not perish but have eternal life. And then that next verse, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved through him. And when I heard that that was kind of what he was going to talk about, I, I, I thought, you know, that's great. I mean, I agree with that verse. I love that verse. It's a great verse, but I've heard it. I'm sure somebody in the room needs to hear that tonight, but I don't really need to hear it. I've heard it. I understand it. I believe it. I agree with it. And so I, if I'm honest with you, I think I probably just closed my eyes and decided I was going to take a little nap, um, like, you know, you occasionally do on Sunday mornings when I'm preaching. So it's only payback. It's fair. And so as he starts on and he gets on, all of a sudden he gets into the message and I begin to hear John 3, 16 and 17 differently than I'd ever heard it before. And it began to affect me and convict me, this simple, basic scripture. And I just got overwhelmed with the reality of sin in me. And God began to convict me and challenge me about my own attitudes and actions and some things that I knew weren't good and weren't right in me. And I began to be overwhelmed with the fact that his grace towards me had already forgiven those things as a Christian even before I committed them. That In my unfaithfulness to God, he was still faithful to me. And it just 
stirred in me something different and new and meaningful. And at the end of the sermon, band came up and they're doing some song, they're singing, probably some Amy Grant song or something back then, I don't know. Some of you don't even know who that is anymore, but that's all right. And as they started singing, I started crying. And not just a little bit, which is not normal for me. Like my normal experience when we're singing together, I mean, I'll be down here, maybe hands raised, maybe head bowed, praying, singing, enjoying, worshiping or whatever. But I don't usually get overcome with emotion or tears. But I was crying and not just a little bit. I was bawling like a baby. Couldn't catch my breath. Snot running down my face. It was just ridiculous, right? I mean, literally, I, looking back, I think to myself, I had to look like my mom watching Henry Fonda die at the end of On Golden Pond when I was a kid. <laughs> and for all you under 30 that don't know what movie that is, On Golden Pond, that's like your grandparents' version of Me Before You or The Fault in Our Stars, all right? This unnecessarily emotionally draining movie that just leaves you feeling punched in the gut for no good reason at all. Why would anybody watch those movies, right? Every guy in the room said... Oh, you chickens. Your wives like the Hallmark Channel, don't they? Literally, last month, my wife and I are on an airplane going out on a trip. And I look over, I go to ask her a question. We're both sitting on an aisle seat. I turn to ask her a question. Tears flowing. I was like, what is wrong? And she turns, me before you. I was like, why are you watching that movie? I've seen it before. I didn't think I'd cry this time. The flight attendant bringing her napkins. to watch. Anyway, it was ridiculous, but... But here's the point. Why did I get so emotional that night over a verse that I'd heard a thousand times before? Because to truly encounter the risen Jesus cannot leave you unaffected. To truly know, to truly experience the forgiveness and grace and mercy of God and for God to make you aware of your sin and also make you aware of his grace and his love and his mercy towards you, it affects you deeply. And that night, as only God can, he convinced me in no uncertain terms that I was not worthy of his grace, but he loved me enough to give it to me. And I've never thought of my sin and God's grace the same since. That's been years ago. And friends, what I'm getting at and what I hope you understand is not that to follow Jesus and to love God, that every time you come to church, you gotta use your shirt as a Kleenex. Like, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is simply this. If you've not been changed and transformed and moved in some way by the reality of Jesus in you, maybe it's because you're standing on a shadow of God and not the reality of Jesus. It can't help but leave you different. It can't help but move and change and overwhelm you with his grace. Because by the grace of God, I am what I am. And here's what this statement means to the Apostle Paul. In the verse right before this, here's what he says. I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Before he was a Christian, Paul was religious. Very religious. So religious, in fact, that he saw Christians as God's enemy and made it his goal to persecute as many of them as he could. And he says... That's who I was. I was an enemy of God. I was an enemy of the church. I was so blinded by the shadows of faith and religion that I was trying to keep to the letter of the law that I missed the reality of God and the work of Jesus. That's who I was. But thank God that's no longer who I am. By the grace of God, I'm something new. By the grace of God, he's changed me. And friends, if you try to approach Jesus in a very impersonal kind of a way. I don't know how else to say this, but you're going to be highly disappointed in what you get. If you try to approach Jesus and the message of the cross as, ah, I believe it happened. And you know, I, I got some bad habits over here. I sure could use your help overcoming. That's fine. I got some decisions over here I need to make. You could help me make some great ones. That'd be fantastic. My kids, <laughs> Lord knows they need Jesus. So I'm going to come to church, we're going to seek Jesus, all that's good, but God, let's not get too carried away with this whole thing. Let's kind of leave some of this radical stuff at a distance. I, I, I'm okay in some areas, but not in every area. You approach Jesus that way, you will be disappointed in what you find. You'll be disappointed in what you experience. Because the problem with that approach 
is that what we find in Scripture is to know Jesus, to truly know Jesus, is to have an awareness that sin has broken you, distorted the image of God in you to such a degree you cannot repair it on your own. Only the grace of God through Jesus can. And that moves you. The world says, human logic says, I don't need saving. I'm not that bad. I'm not as good as some, but I'm not as bad as many. I mean, throw some religion in there, sure, it'll help me out, but I don't need saving. The death and resurrection of Jesus has a different message. Oh, yes, you do need saving. Because no one's righteous, not truly righteous. And when you look at Jesus on the cross, what you see, to truly see the cross is your sin, and my sin, and our sin. And God's righteous, justified judgment of that sin passing over us onto him on that cross. Buried and three days later raised by the power of God to not only say you can be forgiven, but you've been, you can be forgiven and made new through the resurrection of the Son of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. But how does that happen? How does God's grace make you new? Let's go back to the very first verse in this chapter that we read a few minutes ago. Paul says that I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. There's four statements in that verse that I don't want you to miss. First, Paul says, here's how the grace of God towards you changes you and makes you new. First of all, the gospel was preached it was proclaimed, it was told, you understood, you heard this gospel message. What's the gospel message? That in the beginning, God created us in his image. But all of us, in whatever way, have sinned and broken that image and walked away from God and distorted God's image in us and nothing we can do can repair that. But on the cross and through his resurrection, God gave the way to make all things new to those who would believe. That is the gospel message. And that message was preached to you. But you didn't just hear it, and you didn't just understand it. You did one better. You received it. You accepted it. You trusted it. You believed it. This message of Jesus enduring what I deserve, I accept. I receive. I trust. I believe. And because you receive the gospel, here's what happens. You now stand on the gospel. Your standing before God is not based on how many religious shadows you perfectly keep. It's not based on how many religious experiences you attend, how good you are at praying, how faithful you are at reading the Bible, how well and generous you give. Your standing before God is based on the gospel of Jesus. I stand before God cleansed, my conscience clean, my life made new only because of the work of Jesus. And because that is the message you've received and on which you stand, through that message of the gospel, you are being saved. And notice what it says. It does not say through that, you were saved, but you are being saved. You were the moment you believed, you still are, until the day it is fulfilled and you are in the presence of God forevermore. Through the gospel in which you stand, you are being saved. That is how God's grace towards you makes you new. By receiving and standing on the work of Jesus, his work on the cross, and even more importantly, his resurrection from the grave. I stand on it, I receive it, I believe it, and it's saving me. Now, I want to close by being direct and asking you to consider something. And here's what I want to ask you to consider. If you are here and you would say, that's me. The message of the gospel, I've heard it. I've heard it preached many times, or maybe today's the first time, whatever it might be. I've heard the gospel preached and yeah, I've received it, I believe it, I stand on it. It saved me. But that message of the gospel is not changing you in any way. It's not affecting you in any way. It's not moving you and making you new in a deeply personal way. I want to ask you to consider that maybe the reason why is because in actuality you're standing on a shadow of God instead of the reality of Jesus. Maybe the reason why your life's not been made all that different by Christ in you is because you're trusting in an experience more than you are the presence of Christ. Maybe it's because you believed in your righteous actions and attitudes 
instead of the grace and mercy of God. Maybe you're trusting and standing on the hope of a shadow instead of the gospel. And as glad as I am that you're here today, you being here today, our room being filled three times and the tent being full and people online, that was not my greatest hope today. My greatest hope is that there would not be one person that hears these words today that would not walk out those doors or shut off their computer or close their app on their phone or walk out of that tent that would not be clear that my standing before God is right because I stand on the work of Jesus alone. I came here today to celebrate my risen Savior. My hope for tomorrow isn't how much I pray and how faithful I am. My hope for tomorrow, for today, my standing before God, the hope on which I give my life is the gospel of Jesus on who the penalty of my sin passed over me onto him. He was crucified, died, buried, and was raised to give me not only forgiveness, but life. That's the message that I stand on that I hope in. And because I'm hoping in that, God is saving me still. Friend, can you say, do you know that that is where you stand? I pray that it is. Don't stand on just a shadow of a religious church service. Don't stand on a shadow of how often you pray. Don't even stand on the shadow of the word of God. Did I just call the Bible a a shadow? Yes, because the point of our faith isn't what's in this book. The point of this book is to point to Jesus, who is the one we stand on. You following me? You can have this entire thing memorized like Paul did. And your shadow of religion caused you to miss the God that came to save you. Don't let that happen. Stand on the gospel that you've received and heard and be saved. And for those of us that are in this room that are clear, no, I'm standing on the gospel. That is my hope. That is where I stand. Friend, today, let today be a chance to celebrate, to remember, and to honor the one, the only one, that could accomplish what we most needed, salvation, forgiveness, and bring God's merciful grace to you in a way that makes you new. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And I wonder this morning, how many of us, if we all can say, that's where I stand. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. And that there is no amount of religious activity, actions, or shadows that can ever redeem us or make us right with you. God, my prayer this morning is for everyone in this room, everyone watching, everyone joining us outside, wherever they might be, would clearly know and have made that decision today to stand on the gospel of Jesus. God, I pray that right now you would be drawing maybe those to yourself that were standing on a shadow instead. God, show them the inadequacy of that. and Show them your faithfulness through your son. And thank you for what we are about to celebrate. Lives made new through the power of Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.